Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. This is 103.9 Wozo Radio FM all day, all long, all live here talking to you about the greatest <laughs> uh, news in atheism, science, free thought, uh, spirituality, possiferianism, you name it. We got everything you can imagine on this show today. In fact, today we're going to be talking about is Christianity polytheistic or not? A topic of a great amount of controversy and no better controversy laid out on the plate before us than our own dread pirate higgs dread pirate higgs <laughs> one let me know how you're doing and then two if you don't mind please lead us in on our daily or weekly invocation sure well uh right now i'm up in uh, fort st john i'm back up working well actually waiting for work uh, i'm going in a little later this morning to do some cross training into the safety aspect of uh, working in the oil and gas industry Safety so, so important. Absolutely. It's important work that you're doing. Safety first. We, want, we all want to go home for dinner, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's what I've been up to. Um, yeah, other than that, it's uh, just biding my time, wait for some work. What's the quality? Okay, so how about this? We'll go into invocation, and I got some follow-up questions. How about that? Sure. Okay, so... This is this is a nice short one because you uh, you had mentioned the the last one was <laughs> a wee long so I've got a haiku. Oh, interesting. Noodly okay. Appendage. Yeah, noodly appendage, soft strips on the meatball pile. Ramen fills my soul. Raw. Ramen. Very interesting. So you know, safety is a really important thing. I find that it's the immediate thing that we take for granted when we work for. Uh, when we work in general, because mm -hmm. we assume that we're good at what we do. We assume that we're professionals. And so there is this balance between safety, which is sort of related to doubt. I found that to be really related to doubt in terms of like dogmatic thinking and then confidence, which is sort of related to your uh, awareness of your abilities. Right. And the problem that I have with uh, confidence typically is that it's never in my best interest. It's nice right. to have confidence, but it's never operating in my self-interest. It's always the one mm -hmm. that's saying, you can jump in that tiger pit. You can you can beat up any of those boxers on ESPN. You got this, Ty. You can do it. And that's a good voice. But sometimes doubt is the more important voice in your head to listen to. Up to a limit, of course. You don't want to be debilitated right. by it. But I have found that doubt is always in your self-interest. That's the one saying, you should wear your safety belt. Because you safety seat belt, because you never know if you're going to be in a car accident. You don't know if you're going to get something in your eye. You don't know if you can't fight that tiger. That thing has claws. You can't fight those boxes. You never had a boxing class before. Likewise, when you're at work, you don't know if that machine is on or off. You should double check to make sure it's off. You should make sure it's lottoed out. You should make sure that someone else is in the building in the event that there's an accident. You can let them know. You should make sure that chemical is properly labeled and spend an extra five minutes making a new label. You should always make sure that you are being safe. And it's mm -hmm. hard to be an advocate for doubt as much as safety. Would you yeah. say that's fair? I, Yeah, I, I would put a, a slightly different spin on the doubt thing. I, I think doubt in that respect is good. Mm. But you always do what you practice often, right? Mm. So to, I mean, you can have confidence in your skill, but it should be based on the skills that you practice often. So if you're always putting on your safety belt every time you do a job, then it just becomes a matter of habit. So there isn't even room for doubt to come in there because you're not relying on um, a lack of skill or a lack of practice. You're relying on the fact that this is part of the thing that I do every time I do it. So that, that's why I would add that. of the task. It part, comes with the task. It becomes it. an automatic thing. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, every morning uh, when we're out in the field, uh, you know, every everyone that's working on the site, uh, we all gather around and talk about our respective duties and and how what the hazards are and how to mitigate those uh, risks uh, of exposure to those hazards. Mm. So you know it's it's a big safety culture um, up here, and it's something I really appreciate. Certainly, as being a medic, uh, no one wants to have to employ uh, those skills um, unnecessarily, right? I love it. And I, I also like the fact that the idea behind the safety culture is to defy God's plan. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
exactly if it's in god's plan that you die today by falling off one of the 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 trappings it's the safety yeah. culture's job to make sure god doesn't win that day and that that's the safety right. engineer the people who spent i love it years and years making sure that they got the right kind of fibers the right kind of buckles the right kind of training the right kind of meetings the right kind of engineering yep. administrative and ppe control ppe you know uh, yep. measures put in place is to make sure god doesn't win so, <laughs> <laughs> i love it i think that's a great a great way to put it dread yeah. you had a really how, interesting how have you been oh I, I was listen say, how have you been thank you very much for asking i have yeah. been quite well uh my mother came to visit me for mother's day yes i uh, saw the pictures weekend. that was great yeah, yeah uh we took pictures with the possifarian hat my mom's a jehovah witness uh, but she, right. she, she knows I'm an atheist, totally cool with atheism, uh, knows I'm asexual, totally cool with asexuality. Uh, and I told her about the Pasiferian thing and she's cool with that too. Like, it's nice to have a mom that can see past dogma and just appreciate people for who they are. And so she's an incredible person, uh, slightly hard of hearing. Uh, but we, we went and to a swimming pool that's nearby mm -hmm. and we did tai chi there which was one of the highlights there oh, because, nice. uh what was interesting was because of the water splashing around the frequency of hearing the instructor's voice about what your next set of instructions are doesn't register very well for her and oh, so okay. i needed to sign in the class to mom so that she could understand what the person was saying and i'm i am typically about 30, speaking of confidence, I'm about 30% confident in my signing capability. Okay. However, in that public space, particularly with an instructor, you know, speaking slowly enough to give instructions to everybody and a somewhat limited vocabulary, she's not describing science. She's just like, hey, lift your right, right sure. arm up, get ready to march, do this. I could, I could match everything that she was saying as she was saying it, just that my mom had such a good time that she came back the next day. And I found that to be like nice. a glowing sort of review. And everyone was looking at me and was like, what's he, what's he doing? And everyone was looking at mom and was like, is she understanding what's going on? And so we had a really good time signing back and forth. The only, nice. the only one embarrassing part was I, she, my mom wanted to ride the, the, the disability chairlift in and out of the pool. And the thing was, she's deaf. It's not like she can't walk. Like she, like she's, <laughs> she, she's somewhat athletic. So but she wants to just try it anyway. And she says, okay. can I get away to using it since I'm deaf? It's like, I don't think, I don't even think the lifeguard would understand the connection, but we'll just see if we can get away with it. <laughs> and we got through with it. She got to use the chair oh, yeah. either way. So yeah. Nice. That's fair. Well, she, um, she could have just said, I'm just prepping for the future. Uh, <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, that's about it. I had a really good time. We went over to the arcade good. and, um, we have in my family an interesting dynamic because I have sisters that are Muslim. I have sisters that are still Christian from our upbringing. I myself am an atheist. I was born an atheist. I was indoctrinated into Christianity and I came out of it. Right. My mom of switched. My mom switched religions <laughs> from Christianity to Jehovah Witnesses uh, uh, around the time when I was in college. And so right now we have what you could almost describe as a family that believes in very different gods or lack of belief altogether mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. i wouldn't say necessarily it's polytheistic but it is varied in its approach and from the outside perspective for me just just looking at you know everybody it's theistically diverse theistically diverse thank you but even the funniest thing that's only happened to me once is we were sitting at a quasi quasi ramadan quasi thanksgiving sort of meal prep and my sisters are closing their eyes and they're praying my mom's closing her eyes and she's praying and I'm just looking at everybody. I'm like, everybody's praying to a completely different being, but they, they right. all call them the same name. And I was like, it made less sense to me before, but now I understand it as, um, now I understand it, that it's not about the God that they're believing. It's about this personal relationship that they're trying to build mm. with this God. And that's what they're, you know, really talking to mm. they're really just talking to an aspect of themselves and i'm fine with that yes uh, and i would agree with that yeah. Yeah. but i wonder is it easier if to do that if you had a poly poly polytheistic cadre of gods to believe in rather than just one monolithic god that everyone's supposedly talking to mm -hmm. and i guess mm -hmm. i'll uh throw up the idea to you what did you mean by well, christianity is polytheistic 
Well, I mean, when you consider sort of like the Roman Empire or, or the Greek uh, civilization, where they had, you know, their host of, of gods, um, there was nevertheless a chief god. You know, there was Zeus uh, right. and Kronos, Kronos before him. Correct. Um, and, uh, you know, Hera, the wife of the top god, sort of like, uh, you know, Mother Mary would be sort of the bride of God and the mother of Jesus, right? Uh, and then you consider things like the devil uh, and the host of angels like Gabriel, Moria, and, uh, Raphael. Azazel, yep. Um, yeah, and the, really, they all seem to represent um, the host, the heavenly host, which really is a symbol simulacrum of Olympus or whatever the Roman uh, host called themselves. So that's why, um, despite claiming to be a monotheistic uh, religion, they are in fact polytheistic. Right. Because of course you, you, you don't carry, you know, you'll carry a, uh, you know, some people wear a cross, some people will carry a, uh, a charm with, uh, you know, uh, St. Joseph or, you know, Mother Teresa or whatever, um, you know, as a, uh, I guess, as a way in for a special um, acknowledgement of right. special power that, you know, for instance, uh, they have different saints for um, different aspects of your life, you know, one mm. of traveling and one of right. singing and one of Whatever construction, you know, uh, who knows, right? But uh, we can take it even more fundamentally. You take standard Christianity, standard Protestant Christianity. You don't have a singular God. You have a Trinity. You have a Jesus. You have a Holy Spirit, and you have a God. And mm -hmm. if you can't see God, well, you know Jesus is in this book. And if you don't see Jesus, you know you have this feeling inside of you. That's your Holy Spirit. And if you don't have that Holy Spirit, you have God who you can pray to to get the right. salvation from jesus to get the holy spirit and you're just constantly caught in this loop where it's a tautology right <laughs> right right it's like who am i praying to what's going on it's like just pick one yeah, yeah, just yeah. pick one pick one and start they're, they're on just you're good they're just trying to cover all the bases right <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i proposed this a long time ago where i said like hey if i flip a coin this is the other coin example i had but if i flip the coin and if it's heads i win or if it's tails you lose would you want to play that game with me? And a lot of people wouldn't because they realize no matter what I lose and yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to yeah. outline what a false, non-falsifiable argument is like one word, no matter what you do, you're never going to win. Why would you use a system like that? Why would you play a game like that? You should always right. know what it takes to win and lose before you start, you know, a new system or process yeah. or a game. Right. Yeah. Uh, the same can be said for like catching logical fallacies and a belief that you hold to be truly true. But I, yes. I do like the idea of saints. I listen, I, and this is a controversial take. I like the idea of saints. I like polytheism. I like it in the sense of it makes more sense for me to have a structured sort of enterprise of wish fulfillers, right? Than one guy with one phone <laughs> who's constantly yeah, yeah. on like, all right, I'll help you find your keys. Okay, I'll help you find your keys. Okay, I'll help you find your keys. Oh my gosh, this is this sucks. I wouldn't want to do this for a right, I want right. to, there should be a God of finding the keys in the morning. Yeah, and I'm yeah, sure they, there is. But the saint of lost things. The saint of lost things. Is there a saint of lost things? Or did you just make that up? Because I'm I'm sure there is. I'm all right, sure Dredd, if not, I'm putting your name in the hat next time uh <laughs> the, the saints go around. Because Saint of Lost Things would be my number one favorite saint. I can't tell you how many times until I buy enough trackers and tiles to keep myself satisfied. I'm literally sitting, yeah. if you don't know this, let me just pull this up. Just for, I'm literally sitting in a pile of trackers and tiles that I keep on oh. me <laughs> at nearly nice. all times because I keep losing my glasses, my wallet, you know, and in order for me to find my wallet, I'd be like, where was I? Where did I leave my wallet yeah. last? It's in my pants. Okay. Yeah. Where are my pants? Just like the Lego yeah. movie. But um, those yeah, those he, things are actually coming in handy for uh, my mom, who is uh, has advanced Alzheimer's. Um, ah, so so what she'll do, she she's paranoid, right? She's quite mm -hmm. paranoid. Mm -hmm. Um, so what she'll do is she'll hide her phone, 
And then when she can't, when she can't find her phone, she says, well, someone's stealing it. And it's this circular right. thing that happens. And of course, right. so, so now we've stuck a tracker on her phone and on her TV remote. That's, that's the, that was the, the clincher right there it was like, because that's all she does all day is watch TV. And so when she hides a remote to go walk the dog, because right. she thinks someone's going to come and steal it. Then she comes back in, can't find it, and thinks that someone stole it. Wow. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a terrible, um, it's a terrible life. But uh, uh, yeah, trackers, trackers are good. But going back to the enterprise of religion, yes. I do like polytheism for that aspect. I also find that it's really good for the storytelling, but it also has this really weird parallel with technology, where as I get better at tracking stuff, with technology and science, that God who I pray to doesn't become as important anymore. And does that mean mm -hmm. that the God of technology or batteries being charged becomes more powerful over time? Like that could be a really interesting narrative that I can imagine could cause more people to tell stories and folklore relating to these gods. Because what is the mm -hmm. pantheon stories other than gods bickering with each other as they go up and down well, in relevance? Yeah. And I think uh, helping people to acknowledge the fact that Christianity is at its basis polytheistic mm. would help them get a better understanding of it in the context of, of religion over human history. Mm. When you make those direct comparisons between the Greek pantheon and, and the Roman pantheon with what the Christian pantheon is, or even uh, the Norse gods, um, you know, most uh, religions throughout history including the Egyptians, uh, were polytheistic. Um, you know, there was always one mm. uh, that was kind of like the father of, or the, the chief god. But um, certainly, uh, you could talk to 10 different people and have 10 different ideas right. of how that heavenly host is run mm. uh, under that head god, right? You say, oh right. yeah, well, we believe in the one god. But then we've got all these other sort of sub gods or um, demons or whatever you want to call them uh, that minister uh, God's will, right? So, uh, right. I, I, I think it would just help uh, clarify to Christians that they're not actually very unique, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Uh, and and even when um, uh, you know when. Uh, uh, Constantine, uh, Emperor Constantine there, um, accepted Christianity as a, a, as a religion recognized by right. the Roman Empire. Right. Um, he was just including Yahweh into the pantheon of gods that were accepted by Romans. He yeah. wasn't saying it was exclusive. He wasn't making any kind of exclusive announcement that Christianity was it. Mm. It was just, we just stopped killing Christians now and We'll just accept them into the fold. And imagine which is which is what I'm waiting, of course, for you know the Canadian government to do. Just take us into the fold. But think about it. You think of it as like Christianity is not that unique in the sense that you know this is just one of the gods that they absorbed as they were trying to take over Jerusalem and you know Middle East and stuff like that. But what if Rome went north instead, like and try to take over Scandinavian areas or territories or proto proto areas like that. And next thing you know, we have runes and Norse mythology being wrapped into the, the Roman uh, catalog mm -hmm. of gods. And all of culture changes because the Roman Empire had such a huge impact that now, instead of Christians, we have these druid <laughs> dream catchers. And they're like, no, we are ancestor worship. That, that was, we worship the one great ancestor the one great ancestor of all time who controls all ancestry. And you can see the same parallel evolution take place because while that might sound a little silly, that's basically what happened in history. Like at one time, one guy said, we're going that way and we're going to observe yeah. all the gods there. Yeah. And if he appointed the other but direction, I, I do. What's up? Yeah. I, I, but I do think that actually has happened, right? To uh -huh. a, a, a large extent because as Christianity kind of moved throughout the world, mm. it really gobbled up other religions took on their traditions yes. wrapped them in the christian sheath yes uh so that people were still like haitians uh oh that's yeah. a real good example voodoo is all the trappings of christianity 
but it's still their old religion, right? Great point. It's Great just, point. It's uh, just been subsumed by the new uh, kind of um, uh, cloth, the new clothing. Uh, but at its heart, it's still you know, killing chickens and um, casting spells and, and whatnot, right? They right. just do I'm... it with uh, a Mother Mary statue and, uh, you know, some of the trappings of Christianity to make it, uh, I guess. No, uh, you're right. The fingerprints are all yeah. there. The fingerprints on that crime yeah. scene are all there. We have a seven-day yeah. week named after Norse gods. We worship the sun, right. the moon, Tyr, uh, and I forgot where Wednesday came from, but Frida is Friday. Like you think about it for a moment, you're like, wait a second, God made seven days, but named them after completely different gods. Like, why yeah. would you do why would you do that? Yeah. Uh, Linda Marty Mercury. So Mer Mercury is actually Wednesday. What okay, Wednesday. I'm, I'm sure there's a Norse equivalent. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so uh interesting concept because the the paper trail is there. It's just a question yes. of is there a willingness to see it? Because mm -hmm. I have, from my own Christian perspective, I took it from a big point of ignorance that I knew what my religion was about because I had a personal relationship with that God. But right. when I gave myself some more time to introspectively understand the reason, reasonability of the approach that I was using and realize that it wasn't reasonable at all, it didn't switch me out of Christianity overnight, right? Mm -hmm. I had to systematically go through a transition process of sure. letting go yeah. of this relationship that I had and realizing that it, there wasn't any major consequence that came from, there was no drop from letting go of that rope, right? Because the rope wasn't connected yeah. to anything itself. The rope dropped yeah. and I stayed in the same right. place. The rope was on the floor, yeah, if anything. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then was... real... go on ahead. Go ahead. Go on ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, when I dropped that rope, I'm just standing and I'm like, okay, what else do I need to hold on to? And I just found better things to hold on to. And that since then I was right. looking myself up, I'm off the floor mm -hmm. and I have enough grip strength to be like, oh, look where I was. Why didn't I just jump up here? Because I couldn't, I had to, it took time. I had to climb out of yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, um, you know, reflecting on Christianity in these different lights mm. is like reading the Bible. Um, mm. For me, reading the Bible was what really opened my eyes to the fact that this is absurd. This is crazy. Yes. This is horrible. This is violent. Yes. This is uh, misogynistic. It's, uh, you know, it's all those horrible, terrible things. I'm going to take a, an extra stab at that. It's not just reading the Bible because I read the Bible the entire time when yeah, I was a yeah. kid up to my high school. It was yeah. reading the Bible with while being a good person, while understanding scruples, while having some understanding of ethics, it doesn't come to you automatically. You have to, you have to evolve into the kind of person to go back to your dogmatic textbook and read that with some sort of critical mindset. Yes. yes. Yeah. And be willing to and listen to that feedback. Yeah. And it certainly can't serve as a template towards being a good person. Correct. It's just, it's Correct. not built that way, right? Exactly. You had to be a good person <laughs> first and be yes. honest, intellectually honest first. So that's on you because right. I can tell you millions, billions of people are reading their Bibles and they're not making yeah. that, that, that transition, but you did. Well, and oftentimes too, people are reading what they're told to read mm. to focus. You know, they go on Sunday, the preacher says, uh, let us turn to uh, such and such and, and read this. And, and of course, avoiding always the ugly bits. Sure. Um, yes. You know, just as a as a as a means of directing the attention of uh, the congregants um, to what they want uh, them to focus on, as opposed to just going, "Have at it, read what you want, and ask me questions." But Dredd, that's not have, the way it works, right? <laughs> Dread. I have a very short story on that that pastor sure. thing that you're telling me about. Sure. When my mom was over here, she hates magic tricks, by the way. So I don't frame this as a magic trick because it, she'll go crazy if I tell her it's a magic trick. So all I did was I took a deck of cards. I was like, hey, mom, do you want to play a card game? Because she will play card games. And I'm there sitting, sh uh, ripple, riffle shuffling cards together, riffle shuffling cards together, riffle shuffling. And I was like, mom, I think this deck is broken. And she asked me, why do you think it's broken? Because I flip it over and I, after like four riffle shuffles, I fan the whole thing out and everything's in perfect order. It's like, no matter what I do, I can't seem to shuffle these cards together. So I put it together. I riffle shuffle again <laughs> and I show her it. And she's like, oh, let me, let me help you. And she just shuffles the deck and then gives it to me and they're all in random order again. Because in right. her head, she didn't understand that I would, in her mind, she, she wasn't thinking that I was setting up for a magic trick. 
because when you do magic tricks, it's very important that you inform your audience what you're doing so that they yeah. can come up with some sort of expectation so that you can, uh, what do you call it? Avert, subvert that expectation and be like, how did you do that? But I didn't frame yeah, it that it's way. It's a manipulation. I was just, yeah, I was just like, hey, this card's broken. I can't, this deck's broken. I can't get it out of order. She's like, oh, you're weird. You're dumb. Come on, kid. Just, just like this, that easy. I was like, you didn't understand the thing I was doing. And the same thing. Pastors yeah. are doing the same thing. Pastors are doing the same yeah. thing. They have to frame the discussion on the Bible in a very particular format for it to have an efficacy on right. its congregation. They can't just be like, show up one day and like, Jesus is going to save everybody. Uh, you're all sinners, but if you pray, you're going to be okay. And here are the citations. See everybody. That's a quick, that's yeah, a quick yeah. sermon. You have to do it in a very particular way with particular songs where people can feel good about themselves, where you pass the hat at just the right time. You get that tithing yeah. money and it's the whole production. Yeah. If I was a pastor, yeah, I'd be a sure. really, I'd be a very unsuccessful one because I'd just be like, you guys are done. <laughs> <laughs> There we are. <laughs> All right. We're getting close to the bottom of the half hour. Uh, we're going to come right back in and we're going to be talking about more concepts of designing Christianity to be more addictive and then also atheism for profit coming right back after this break. Hello and welcome back to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour or Let's Chat Podcast or Mind Pirates. YouTube extravaganza. Arr. Arr. Guys, we are here again talking about Christianity and religion in a whole, trying to understand this design from an atheist perspective, trying to understand what we can do to better communicate some of the, uh, not necessarily issues, but the irks that we have with it, and have like a very intelligent conversation regarding belief, why we believe things, and what we can do to get ourselves out of holes. We had a really great conversation in the first half regarding Christianity being polytheistic in nature, particularly in its origins, and how that's mm -hmm. an important thing to recognize because it helps to broaden. There's enough evidence there that anyone of inquiring minds can easily figure that out. And two, it'll help to hopefully break apart those dogmatic chains that are keeping people to uh, a belief system that isn't as special as they might put as much you know, confidence into. And so now mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about the design of Christianity. I'm going to open this up with a question. Dredd, have you ever played video games before? Um, video games? What are those? Yeah, it's like this thing that you put in your hands and you do you do this thing. I think the signing version of it is like literally that, but I oh, think the that, old school okay. ones used to be like joysticks. Yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah once so, or twice. <laughs> so when I was a kid, when I was a kid, the first game that, the first system we ever had was a Nintendo Entertainment System. That was in the 80s. And it wasn't the first video game system that ever existed, but I remember oh, it. Sure. Right. I remember it because my mom brought over like this box and we had to connect it to the TV. And it was the most confusing thing possible because there were these red uh, little dongles and yellow little dongles. And on the back of our TV, there was a red hole and a yellow hole. And the whole time we were like, which one goes in which hole? <laughs> which one goes right. in which one? We don't know. Why are there instructions? Why isn't there like a internet database of videos where we could just easily figure this out? <laughs> like we were all, right. we were entirely on our own, right? And so we figured out a way to plug it in. And it started me on this journey of understanding like games outside of arcades, because we had arcades before, but of games and seeing how they evolve and change over time based on the culture of the people who make them or are influenced by them. And the interesting thing is game design from the long, you know, virtual experiences that last thousands of hours to the ones that are short on your phone have sort of bifurcated into very different cultures. Somewhere it's all about telling a story, somewhere it's about an experience, and then somewhere it's about addictive profit. I am making this game to get as many people to play this game and pay money as much as possible. And those games are very mm -hmm. successful and very lucrative. And it makes me think, why hasn't religion, which has been around much longer than games, right? Or, or gods, mm -hmm. if anything. Why haven't they followed course on any of these addictive models? Why isn't religion or Christianity or Pasifarianism or, you know, any of the classics, classic gods, more like the addictive games. Why is it, here's your book, come every week, train this on your kids by, before they understand critical thinking skills. See you later. Why isn't it just, here's the app, uh, the first one's free and $2.99 yep. for a monthly subscription. It's like, why, 
what's 10% of my paycheck have to do with this? It, 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 I'm really confused. Dread, do you think that religion can learn from the addictive models of gaming? And why haven't they already, if not? Well, I, I think they have. Uh, certainly the move of, or the increase of people, even though there's a, a decline of people who identify as any particular religion, uh, those who identify as Christian are increasingly moving towards uh, those evangelical models. And mm. I think that is the gamification mm. of Christianity right there. It's oh, I like engaging it. instead of this pulpit where it's, you know, from the top down and uh, you just listen to the fire and brimstone story and, and behave when you leave. People are engaged in a way that, you know, they participate, you know, with you're speaking in tongues or whirling dervishes or um, handling you know, stakes, seizures on the floor or whatever the heck you're doing. Yeah. Uh, playing with snakes. Exactly. Uh, it's uh, it's about engaging the audience in a participatory way um, so that they are now a character. I get in, it. In the thing. I get it. It's sort of like the button on mobile games where it's like, tell a friend about snakes yeah. and talking in tongues <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. and you click a button exactly. and, and it already has the pre-made email and it's just like would you like to tell your twitter friends would you like to tell your google contacts and just push these buttons yeah. and, and it just goes out and next thing you know yeah. i'm sitting here with alerts on my phone being like why is kevin telling me about snakes and talking in tongues i'll check yeah. it out that five yeah. percent of people are like ah, i got nothing better to do right yeah. you know I, well I a part of it too i think is is by getting you in the door, mm. right? Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, about the collective effervescence is what finishes the job. You know mm. what I mean? Like, you know, coming in the door, you know, if somebody can get you in the door, they're almost relying strictly on collective effervescence to to hook you. Right. Uh, to, to, to engage you. And it's like, well, just try this game. You know, this is really a uh, play wow just once. And, uh, you know, it may capture your attention. Sure, there's uh, millions of people that play wow just for sure. that reason. But I mean, good I have graphics, to... it's a good story. Um, you know, there's lots of interaction, there's quests, yeah. there's this, you know. So I think religion is just is gamified in that way. I, it's a social network, right? Like yeah. it's, it's essentially a club that has some air of exclusivity behind it um, because we're the chosen people. And by joining a church, you get all the perks of being part of an exclusive new club, which comes with yep. new people, new self sense of self importance, which is very good for people's esteem in a culture that doesn't very do that doesn't do a lot to build esteem being in a prestigious mm -hmm. group, even if it's your neighborhood church. Can mean a lot to you particularly if it's like one of the biggest churches you can be like i can wear the shirt that has the logo of our church or mega church on it and i can feel like there's a sense of collective with other people who have maybe the same bumper sticker like i feel like there's a camaraderie of people who would support me in the event that i have problems i have a god that i'm directly networked to we all have leadership that we agree upon which helps to alleviate some sense of am i normal yes i am because everyone else must think exactly like me it does a lot of Neur neural benefits to be in a collective environment like that right yeah and also also mm. it helps you know because it it establishes the in-group out group right yeah so once you become part of the in-group you now have a way to focus on the outside to yes. establish an out group Correct. that way your shortcomings are not the focus of anyone's attention Right. It's the out group you can all collectively look at and right. say that those are the people that are wrong, right, or evil or heathen or or whatever. So it 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 is it's divisive. Yeah, taking it to a it taking it to like a primitive level, like you have a lizard brain, which is your very yep. I lizard brain does not literally mean you have a lizard brain in your brain. Sometimes people on YouTube are like, haha, I clipped this out of the podcast. And here's got Ty with a degree in biochemistry. And he says, we're half lizard. It's like, I didn't say that. I'm saying we have a very <laughs> basic part of our brain that hasn't really evolved over time very much. And so yeah. it's really yeah. important for our mainly core functions. And some degree of that is how autonomic we systems. Yeah. Right. 
and how we react to things and how those things are controlled in our body. And the fear reflex is a big component of that. Uh, I will tell you two examples. One, if I'm running through the woods and I'm scared, it's dark, I'm terrified, and I have no idea what's coming out at me, my my fear complex in my brain or my lizard brain is going off like, there's danger there, there's danger there, there's keep running or get ready to fight. Keep running or get ready to fight. You got to keep moving or get hold the position, keep fighting, but keep running if you can, because you know that's good. I'm freaking out. However, if I run into a cave and I turn around and now I got like a pointed stick facing out towards the opening of the cave. Now my entire, mm. I know my back is safe and I'm yeah. facing one unknown danger that can only come to me from one side. I kind of think like that's how the, the, the inside outside group operates. When I'm outside, I'm running through a variety of different sort of threats, field lies, communities that I can't necessarily trust, neighbors who might mm. be untrustworthy, et cetera. But when I'm inside a closed group, now I can be like, here's my group, turning my eyes outside. And now I can look at everybody knowing that the people behind me have my back. Yeah. I feel like yeah. that is somewhat alleviating to the fundamental parts of my brain and how that works. And I can't deny that. I can't mm-hmm. deny that that feels good. Whether it's yeah, accurate well, sure, or not. You're human. Yeah, you have right. the same brain everyone else does. Right, but whether hope. or not that's accurate, that's that's the other thing. But I do feel like that gamifies religion. Uh, on, mm-hmm. a, on a big aspect. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing I don't, I find to be a little weird with religion, maybe I, I, I'd love to get your feedback on this is in games, there is a progressive model. You know, I'll beat level one, level two, slightly harder, level three, slightly harder than that four. And I, yeah. and I get to use more complicated mechanics such that if they're given to me all at once, I'd be overwhelmed. But if you drip feed them to me, I can build a sort of skill set that helps me feel good when I tackle harder challenges and I get that little feedback Mm -hmm. dopamine rush. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like Um, that in Christianity? What would you think that could be related to? Well, certainly in masonry, I, I saw that as a Freemason, um, you know, where you're at, go through uh, successive initiations and there's this ladder you climb Mm. uh, towards Hubarship. Um, Scientology, same way, right? Yes. Uh, they get you in, and and then you go through these clearing through these levels until you start believing in aliens and Venatu or whatever his name is. Um, but it's it's building on successive uh, levels of delusion, essentially. Mm. And it's and how does a game work? Well, I play WoW, and I'm level seventy. But I had to start at level one, right, and work my way up and progress, and you know, practice and get better at working with other people who like this, the same game, so that we could defeat monsters together. So, um, you know, the the difference, of course, is I know it's a game, hmm. and people of these religions don't; they don't get it. But yeah. I, you know, I I don't know uh, specifically about Christianity because it. It tends to be well. Certainly, the models I've been exposed to is you have the preacher, and then you've got the congregation, and you may have, you know, people who, you know, uh, I guess are part of the the preacher's council or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's there's not too many levels to that. Um, so, so I'm not surprised that there's a pecking order because no one's going to walk into her church and be like, "I'm I'm the same level as the pastor," or "I'm the same level as the deacon." Or I'm the same level yeah. as the guys who are mem- like, there's that membership tier you don't see when you first walk in. But I also mm-hmm. think that the way the structure of what you're taught is, is broken up so that there's like level ones based on your age group. And when I was in Bible yeah. study, when I was a young kid, they'd start us on the fanciful stuff immediately. Noah's Ark, uh, uh, King Jonah David, and the Whale. Jonah and the right. Whale. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times we have to draw that with crayons and stuff like that. Adam and Eve, <laughs> all the fantas- fanciful yeah. stuff, because we had in my, now that I see it now, a lower standard of critical thinking that we could operate with so that sure. we could get those stuff indoctrinated in faster. When yeah. you're an adult, when the adults came in, like adult alcoholics, and we were just looking for a second chance, um, people who'd never heard about religion, maybe were coming from a different religion or Christianity and coming from a different uh, religion to understand. People who are married into the church as an adult. 
they would go to adult classes. And when I swapped from children's classes to adult classes, we started on the stories of Jesus. We never talked about the Old Testament. And we were talking about Jesus was just a guy. He was a person just like you and me. And here's him telling these uh, parables and stories and stuff like that. And there was like no magic. And I thought, wow, the adult classes are boring because the kids' classes are fun because they're all about magic and stuff like that. And then I realized, oh, it's because they have, there's like two completely different sets of starter packs in Christianity based on right, what they can right. get away with as an adult. Yeah. And yes, yeah, you're right. When, when you're a kid, after you learn the fanciful stuff, you can graduate into the Jesus stories, but then you're a lot more easily able to accept that he can make fig trees evaporate or walk on water, or multiply right. food, or change water, which only has hydrogen and oxygen, into wine, which has carbon. Where'd you get that carbon from? How did you balance this equation? <laughs> this is a very basic question. Why is it still at room temperature? There's a lot of thermodynamics going on here. You have to understand that. And <laughs> no one wants to answer that question. No one answers that question for me. Uh, yeah. uh, and I can't, I have, ooh, I have people in my science group who are Christian right now and you throw that question out at them and it just like, they get angry at you. It's like, why are you angry at me? I'm asking a very basic question. Like you are a scientist, right. like balance this equation out for me. Like this makes no sense. Um, we have good times. We have good times. I've been <laughs> invited funny. to his home a couple of times. Anyway, the idea is like, yeah, if you're an adult, I think Christianity caters itself to basically try not to break or make you ask too many critical questions. And mm -hmm. will cater a different kind of Christianity to you to make you appreciate what it's all about before it gets into the higher level stuff. Because, for example, like if you're a Mormon or if you are Christian, when you knock on someone's door, you start with the good news. Hey, listen, we're saved. Uh, you, This is all great. And then as you get into the church longer, hey, we're all sinners and you have to repent. Like the yeah. the bait and switch is there at, at oh, aggressively. Yeah, for sure. After yeah. you build up some sort of acumen on what to believe and what not to believe based on right. the level ones yeah. of what you start off with. Because yeah. you don't no, start right. off with you're I a totally singer when you're a little baby. You're just like, oh, there's an arc and, and this is all great. And you're just drawing and right. absorbing all this weird poisonous doctrine. And then you get older yeah, and it's yeah. like, hey, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> well, and, and, and that uh, really speaks to how important your geography your personal geography is to mm -hmm. the religion you are initiated into and how well it sticks. Right. Right. Because, um, you know, uh, it is, I mean, it's just a, a, well, not necessarily just geography, but also the cultural milieu that uh, you start out in. So if, mm. if you're uh, East Indian in West Vancouver or East Indian, East India, uh, you know, you're born into that culture. Exactly. And so you're indoctrinated necessarily by the people you were surrounded by, um, you know, your parents, your parents, friends, your aunts and uncles, um, and whoever, right? Yeah. Same thing. If you're so, like, if you're in Tennessee and you're born in Davidson County, which is where Nashville is located, you are in the most populous area of Tennessee by millions and millions of people and mm -hmm. overwhelmingly secular, overwhelmingly secular. Like right. there, you'll be hard pressed to find high attendance in a lot of the churches in Nashville. It's much more likely in stadiums. However, if you drive 40 minutes outside of Nashville in any direction, any direction, substantially more Christian where there's churches literally on every block. Some are facing right. each other. I've made the joke of, I try to tell people where I live and they can't follow me. They can't follow me. like, what's Oakland? What's, what's this parkway? What street are you talking about? It's like, so you take a left at the first coming of Jesus you go past the passion of the lamb. You take a left at the the second savior. So they're just level. landmarks. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly where you're going. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I, I want to do one more gamification idea because one of the things that I love and hate with games is that they're not perfect. And so sometimes developers have to come out with patches. Are you familiar with patches? You ever heard about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a patch sure. update where some... Sometimes people yeah. will try to speed run a game. Speed running means that they try to beat the game as fast as they possibly can while breaking some of the mechanics in the game. And so right. the developers have to come up with a, uh, you can't do that. And they'll patch the game so that Hot the fixes. speed running routes are a little bug fixes, a little sort of like, eh, nice try, guys. We still have to use yeah. this for something. Don't ruin it for yeah. everybody. There's no cheat codes here. 
And I thought to myself, yeah. okay, our goal is to get to heaven, right? As Christians, if we put our Christian hats on, our goal is to get to heaven. Why are we wasting time on earth? Let's just right. kill ourselves and go to heaven, <laughs> right? Seemed yeah. like a really good plan. Like you put that on paper <clears throat> and I'm like, why are we in this median transitory life? It's like, yeah, this sucks. This is about suffering. It's like, well, let's just stop suffering and go straight to heaven. Like, in fact, if I was young enough, I can get an automatic pass to heaven. It's like, yes, children who die. Right. It's like, why are we wasting time? Let's just give kids whatever means they need to, so they can go straight to heaven. They can even shoot themselves. We can buy, we can sidestep that little suicide route. No yeah. one loves that idea. <laughs> no one loves the idea but that's not like, a popular idea amongst why folks. haven't we got we've gotten edicts from popes we've gotten messages from our pastors like here are the extra stipulations regarding our stance on suicide i'm like you just give me patches to stop the speed run route called life yeah. what's going on yeah 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 no and clearly the motivation is is not because they want you to you to live longer but hmm. to be able to uh, provide more of your cash right and i also love this one too where it's well i'm just going to sin as much as i want my entire life and then right when <clears> i'm <throat> on my deathbed absolve my sins exactly because well Jesus you know blood is and, strong enough to do that so yes. why am and i this, in church now and that is one of the horrible things about that whole thing is uh you know a, a, a pedophile could have abused children yes. uh, all their lives Mm. And the children are atheists, and the guy asks for forgiveness at the end of it. Right. He goes to heaven, and the kids go to hell. <laughs> right? How yeah. does that make sense? <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, we've heard the 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 more classic, or even the wrong are... religion. Right. You right, know, like right, a, right. A, a you know a Catholic priest abusing a Muslim kids. You know, like or, or Buddhists or something. Whatever. It's just. I mean, it's just nonsense. I'm I'm actually reading. Um, uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, Leviathan, okay. okay, where he is, of course, justifying um, uh, monarchy as the only legitimate uh, way to rule uh, or govern uh, people. And of course, it's based on the idea that God is the ultimate sovereign. Ah, uh, that's um, a shame. Because I'd, yes. I'd be willing to... So speaking of games, and I didn't want to interrupt you. Go on ahead. Go on ahead. Finish what you were saying. Well, I was just going to say that's why I came up with this topic is because hey. he spends a great deal of time talking about, uh, you know, the how and, it, and it's weird to read it because, of course, what little is said in the, in the actual Bible, hmm. people have expounded and expanded on to right. make this vast, vast stories enormous fiction uh of which of course there is certainly no proof <laughs> and no way to validate it right right it's just we're taking somebody's word for it more and more and more you know like uh, our own notion of what hell is is really comes from dante's inferno it doesn't mm -hmm. come from the bible no true it's and so for built and fictions around <laughs> yeah so they just hang their fictions on on the good book and right. uh, all of a sudden we've got this enormous oh, fiction don't get me started on bus. that you 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 just transcended to another topic because like what else why else do we have a white jesus that looks suspiciously italian than the one we got now it's just like and this is the guy yeah, from yeah. jerusalem it's like have you been in jerusalem like we know we've had crusades no one looks like that there long flowing hair abs right. and it gets more yeah. progressively lower body fat content as as our yeah. idea of obesity in america gets well, more concerning I, I want to get you, back. Okay. Ahead, ahead. I was just going to say, have you go seen ahead. that picture um, that was on a woman's uh, mantle? And mm -hmm. it was a picture of Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi. And that was her picture of Jesus. Oh, no. I've not yeah, yeah, seen yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. I've not seen that. But <laughs> I mean, it, I'll, I'll it wouldn't it be a stretch to say that a lot of the Star Wars theories are framed off the biblical parables. They oh, have like a very Absolutely. similar structure. That's yeah. one of the reasons why. Yeah moms who are christians are like don't play dungeons and dragons right but watch star wars yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. like these aren't very yeah. different mom they both have people yeah. with red horns coming out of their head you just i'm well and it's there are there's easily the good guys and the bad guys are they're, they're very easy to tell apart right yeah I, we'll we'll break and talk about star wars for a bit if you'd like to but i wanted to okay so i got to go back a couple of pages you were talking okay. about 
help me walk back. I had a very tra- Hobbs Leviathan. Okay, here's the thing. On mm-hmm. speaking of video games, on Epic Games, which is a launcher that you can download for your computer, it's uh, a way for you to buy games on PC. There's a free giveaway of a game right now, if you're watching this, of Fallout New Vegas, which is a video game series that takes place in a post-apocalyptic uh, wasteland that is America after a series of nuclear wars have happened, a series. So like everything's completely irradiated and very little life is left, but a new culture has risen up to take its place. It's sort of Mad Max in its nature. But what's great about Fallout New Vegas is that it is very philosophical in its approach. Because it's not like a morality system where it's good actions, bad actions. Everything has these twisted sort of bittersweet moments where you're constantly doing um, mental gymnastics with characters that have very strong motivations about why they develop their culture in this wasteland the way that they have. And there's one culture that has basically adopted Caesar's model of rule. And while we love to put Roman empire on a pedestal for the people who weren't in the roman empire you get to see what life was like for those people which was these guys are powerful and chaotic and completely full of debauchery of actions where they're murdering people uh stealing looting and it's right. insane how evil they are and how quickly they rewrite their history to make themselves look so good but if you were to talk to that leader because they're framed as the bad guy and you talk to their leader and you're like, hey, listen, you need to stop doing this because we're going to take you down. He's like, listen, your system is a democracy. Your, your, your culture that you have is spread out so far and so bifurcated amongst themselves that you will never last in this culture that we have now. Whereas we are relatively, while we are smaller, we are not that much smaller, and we are unified in one singular purpose with me as the top lead. And let me tell you something. Historically, if you look back in American actual history, if you look back in world history, democracies do not last for a very long time. They are one of the most short-lived forms of governance. And we Mm -hmm. need to have a system that can at least keep its act together because this might be the last time our culture would ever have its act together before we fall apart completely. And there are substantial benefits to this authoritarian rule. Even though it might be seen as tyrannical, if you were to follow the game plan, we won't be as mean to you. If you indoctrinate your, if you put yourself into our system and follow my singular rule, this is the benefits. And he's like laying out the strategy and it's not, it's not a God argument at the end of the day. It's actually just a well-formulated historical based proposition of why authoritarian rules in certain contexts are actually fairly valid. And you have to make a yeah. key decision on whether or not it's still worth breaking them down. And you can do so just through dialogue. You can be like, actually, well, here's my counter arguments. It's a really, really interesting game. Uh, not to spoil yeah. the entire ending, but you would really enjoy it. You, you just, you just uh, outlined uh, Leviathan right there. That's, 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 <laughs> but that's there's no God precisely. Component. Yeah, it's almost yeah. precisely what he's talking about. Is uh, you know, uh, monarchy could be monarchy, democracy, which is ruled by assembly, hmm. but that assembly acts as a sovereign, right? right? So you yes. can have one person or one group of people, right? And that group could also be an aristocracy, right? Yes. Um, so democracy, aristocracy, or monarchy. But right. uh, yeah, no, that that online's right right there what he's talking about. <laughs> So Another thing surprising. he said was like, imagine what would happen if you, if it's really hard to keep a system accountable, whereas for one person, it's much more easily. Not only that, but the trend of a system going corrupt is far faster than one person being corrupt or being replaced it with someone. It gathers momentum, right? Right, right. Because if you get replaced by one idiot, you can replace that idiot with a capable person, you know? And now we, yeah. you, you, you've kept your trajectory somewhat fairly well but if your system becomes more corrupt you can't course correct that as easily and so yeah. so many very persuasive arguments by the end of the day you have to make a decision i won't tell you which ones to pick there are many <laughs> other counter rules of governance in that same game if anything right. watch like a summary video on fallout new vegas at least on fallout the new philosophy vegas, okay. on the new vegas cool. philosophies you would really okay. really appreciate it cool. especially if you're reading yeah. leviathan or any other books that's my shout yeah. out as we reach the end of the episode Dread Pirate Higgs, what would you recommend we check out before the show ends? Or before um, next week and we meet again? Hmm. Well, uh, 
I don't know. <laughs> you can always go to my channel. I, uh, my you know, you're reading a lot pirate. of good books. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, I'm going to be working on uh, Bertrand Russell next. Ooh, um, okay. I, I want to kind of get get all the older philosophers in before I start moving into more current. Can I throw out um, just uh, a recommendation? Yeah. Could you could you read some ancient Egyptian philosophers if you like old stuff? Because the kings of Egypt wrote books as well that were translated yeah. for English readers. And you'd be shocked at how well aligned they are or influential they are for a lot of the, I would say, uh, what's the right period of time, uh, Enlightenment age era of philosophers yeah, yeah. that are out. Yeah. You'd be surprised how well it trends, almost as if those guys read. Or maybe they could, maybe they couldn't, maybe oh, they have the technology too. Yeah, but it's yeah. like, wow, they had their yeah. stuff together even back then. That was great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think I mentioned I had read uh, Marcus Aurelius's uh, meditations, which were mm -hmm. uh, based heavily in Stoicism. So, yes, I'd like to uh, read Cicero um, as the, you know, and, and, you know, guys like Spinoza and, and whatnot to get a, again, a, a feel of, you know, what the, you know, how it progressed over time, you know, starting from uh, the Greeks and Romans and and moving into modern times, but uh, I, I try to go back and forth, you know. So I read Kant and Sartre, and and then now I'm back at uh, um, Hobbes and you know Heidegger and all the rest of it. It's kind of keep it interesting. Some of that uh, old English is really hard to read. Like you know, 1670 was Thomas Hobbes, right? So mm. you know they've got. Uh, you know, page long sentences with commas that you have to, you know, sort of read how they've embedded the meaning, right? Sure. So yeah, it can be tough. Okay. Got a lot of good book recommendations. Thank you, Mind Pirate. And yes. you guys are tasked with at least checking out. Listen, we got a chat GPT AI. You can ask it anything you want. Ask where to start. Start asking yourself some important questions. The main thing is to keep asking questions. That's what the show is all about. It's what the show is for. And if you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section. Reach out to us. You can get me at letschatse at gmail.com or put your comments in the uh, comment field in this YouTube video or reach out to Mind Pirates if you're watching on his channel and just leave a comment there too. Thank you guys so much for joining us on the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Uh, we'll see you next week. And remember, what's my closeout? I don't really have one, but I'll tell you this. It's always good. To, to listen to both your doubt and your confidence. Don't just listen to one or the other. You got to live through balance. That would be my end take. See you, everybody. Thank you so much. Right, man.